How wonderful that you have joined us today for Echo Africa. Welcome. I am Chris Lems coming to you from Ogun State, Nigeria. And with me is my colleague in Uganda. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Chris. Hello, everybody. My name is Sandra Twinobrio here in Kampala, Uganda. Today on the show, we look at why sustainable farming is so crucial to serving our fragile environment. Also, coming up on the program today, how larvae can serve as a useful fertilizer in Uganda. How an architect in Morocco is building houses more sustainably. And why the people in Turkana, Kenya are suffering from climate change. Agriculture plays a major role when it comes to climate change. Things like carbon dioxide emissions created by livestock or clearing forests for arable land. And more and more often, seeds are genetically modified or manipulated. Now, a group of farmers from Tunisia want to stop this trend and are choosing to use the old seed varieties instead. An aubergine harvest not far from the Tunisian capital. Here on his one and a half hectares of land, Salim Masugui farms fruits and vegetables. His yields are smaller than when he uses imported or genetically modified seeds. But Salim Masugui still prefers local seeds. They don't look particularly good. Sometimes they are small and crooked but they produce better quality fruit, more nutritious and tastier, and better adapted to our climate. Salim Masugui avoids artificial fertilizers as well. He prefers to make his own compost. We're trying to produce our own organic fertilizer. First, I use chicken excrement because it has a lot of nitrogen. Then we add the remnants of fruits and vegetables that were thrown out at markets. Finally, we add a bit of hay, which has a lot of carbon. For decades, Tunisia's government bought both hybrid and genetically engineered seeds. They were meant to produce greater yields. The country still imports around 85% of its seeds today. But increasing numbers of farmers want to return to using local seeds. Tunisia's seed bank has been able to help them. They found Asian seeds from Tunisia in other countries, which they returned to their homeland. Since 2008, they've collected more than 7,700 different seed types. The work we're doing today focuses on genes as well as which genotype impacts crop quality and whether or not these traits fit a particular criteria. We might be able to use them for cross-pollination, which would in turn lead to improved yields. To help better market his product, Salim Masugui goes to fairs regularly. They focus on investments and technological developments in farming. This year's slogan is sustainable agriculture, which is an increasingly growing trend in Tunisia as well. The farmers' local seeds are known for their unique taste and health benefits. These are the seeds our grandparents were familiar with. They always found the best ones and passed them on. It is an inheritance they've passed on to us young farmers. Every year they gather the best seeds. Salim Mazigui is fortunate to live so close to the capital. He can market his products at lots of different places, including at sustainable farming events in Tunis. Organic farmers can sell their goods here once a week. We are fighting for independent food production on multiple fronts. We are trying to get farmers to gather seeds. At the same time, we are trying to produce more seeds together with our partners. We are also doing our best to educate farmers and show them how they can contact clients directly or via social media.
The organization hopes that more people will use traditional local seeds as alternatives to imported ones. Salim Mazigui has started collecting his own, like this aubergine seeds. I've grown aware of the important role that local seeds play, and I'm using that knowledge. The demand for the original seeds has risen, and the prices have gone up along with it, which seed sellers are taking advantage of. These seeds should really be available to all farmers. The best case scenario would be farmers obtaining and reproducing them themselves. The strategy certainly seems to be working with the aubergines. Salim Mazigui hopes that they will soon be as plentiful as is lavender, which grows on its own in Tunisia and is considered one of the most common plants in the country. Sticking with the topic of agriculture, a lot has changed since the invasion of Ukraine. For farmers worldwide, seeds and fertilizer have become more expensive. This is why some farmers in Uganda have come up with a new fertilizer, which is not only cheaper than conventional ones, but also better for the environment. In Uganda, the price for some imported fertilizers has more than doubled. Russia, a major supplier, is facing international sanctions, and the Ugandan importers and consumers are feeling the repo effect. Customers are not coming to buy because it's very expensive. It has affected us a lot. Others are just asking the prices, they move away because it's very expensive. Now, a Ugandan agricultural scientist, Abe Lubega, is offering an alternative. It comes from this small fly called the black soldier fly, which has been found to be a source of organic fertilizers. Yeah, these exist within the natural environment, but it's a matter of uh, attracting them and uh, then you start breeding them. One fly lays about average 1,000 eggs. In about four days, the eggs grow into larvae. And when larvae grow into adult flies, they leave behind a pupa rich in nutrients for animal feeds and the soils. You're getting uh, a fertilizer an organic fertilizer that is very reliable, you, you, you produce it on site, you produce it in quantities you want, and then you also get an alternative protein source for in case you're doing livestock. Lubega works with a Dutch-founded company called Marula Protein. The company receives funding from donors, like voluntary services overseas, to train local farmers to produce their own fertilizers. He started with 10 farmers, but today they are over 1,200. Rose Nachiganda says she could not afford fertilizers until she was trained to make her own. I use available resources at my home, such as food leftovers, that I would have thrown away to get fertilizers. I do not spend any money on it, apart from my energy. Kampala Capital City Authority has now partnered with Marula Protein to manage the city's waste problem, as the larvae can feed on organic waste. They now produce over two tons of fertilizers per day, but that's still not enough for farmers. We have orders of standing orders of, of two tons, of one ton, of three tons, of five tons, and we cannot we can we don't have the capacity to, to fulfill that or those orders. Luega hopes this can be an opportunity for Africans to fly away from depending on imported fertilizers on the tiny wings of the black soldier fly. Moving from agriculture to architecture, the construction and operation of buildings contributes to climate change too. The United Nations estimates that this sector is responsible for almost 40% of all carbon dioxide emissions worldwide. Wow, that's quite a lot. And it's one reason architects around the globe are thinking about alternatives like using different building materials. And we went to Morocco to see an example of how some in the industry are doing their bits. New buildings in Morocco are usually made with concrete. That means they usually warm up quickly and aren't very sustainable. Lots of CO2 is produced during the construction, 
and the material can't be recycled. But near the capital Rabat, a small house is being built to last forever, or at least a long, long time, and all its components can be reused if no longer needed. Architect Ibrahim Baruch designed the building and is supervising its construction. The house is made out of clay. He says it can last for centuries if well cared for, unlike concrete, which has a maximum lifespan of 120 years. But the best thing about the material, Baruch says, is the quality of life it offers. This style of housing can insulate buildings from outside heat exceeding 40 degrees Celsius for 14 hours. A great degree of coolness and humidity is guaranteed indoors. In addition, the clay walls absorb heat and serve as a heat reservoir which will keep the house warm in winter, even when there's not much sun. Natural materials for the construction are piled all around the site. Straw makes the brick stable and provides insulation. Wooden logs will support the roof, while stone slabs will serve as frames for windows and doors. But most important is a multi-purpose material, which is used everywhere in the house. We make use of different types of soil for different purposes, forming bricks, gluing them together during the laying process, and straightening the walls afterwards. We also employ natural lime as a substitute for cement. It sticks bricks together and protects buildings from the damage natural elements might cause, especially rain. During the building process, we also rely on hay, wood, and cane. In a few more weeks, the house will be finished. Carbon neutral, sustainable, and recyclable. And probably really cozy, too. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. Whoa, that's pretty inspiring. But the global population keeps growing, which means more construction. By 2030, experts think that almost 60% of the world population will live in big cities. How can we make living in these places greener and build more sustainably? One solution could be the cradle-to-cradle -cradle concepts. Let's take a closer look. These German buildings don't only look modern, but they might also pave the way to a circular future. They're built according to the cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept. The idea is to replace our cradle-to-grave economy where we take, make, and waste with a circular one where the products are designed in a way that its materials can be reused over and over again. Nora Sophie Griefan is the founder of the Cradle-to-Cradle -Cradle Lab. It's an NGO dedicated to spreading circular regenerative design thinking across industries, politicians, and designers. Welcome to the Cradle-to-Cradle -Cradle Lab. You can come in here. We start here, um, you, you see like from the lamps that you can see, um, it's from a mushroom material, totally for biological cycles. According to the concept Nobel Sophie Griefan's father, Michel Braungart, and his colleague William McDonough created, everything we build must go to either what they call the biological cycle or the technical cycle. That means the materials used to build the products need to decompose, thus becoming nutrients for the soil or dismantled to become what they call technical nutrients and reused in other products. So we have a, a showroom here where you can see a lot of products that are already produced in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle manner. This flooring that you can see here, if I move, I can actually take it with me. Uh, quite cool that you don't need to glue this. It is made out from recycling material. Gluing is in a cradle-to-cradle -cradle, not the best idea to do because it's quite difficult to disassemble. The lab uses these carpets that are totally made of recycled fibers. And it's not glued and you can bring it back to the 
Novosophie Griefan argues that there are a lot of natural alternatives to most of our commonly used toxic products. This material is quite interesting because it's like a material that you can just take from the sea and use it and you don't need actually to change it a lot. So-called Neptune balls are basically dead seagrass that could be collected on shores and used as a high-quality insulation material. All these examples seem perfect and relatively easy to implement. But we need to change the way we have built our homes and products for the past decades. 50 years ago, we knew that there are negative environmental consequences if we have certain building habits. So in the beginning, we had felt that we require new knowledges to be able to build appropriately. But right now, we have a different problem. Professor Anupama Kondu is an award-winning architect, mostly known for her sustainable projects like these ones. When standardization is being imposed, then we must have the courage to question the limits of standardization. And the construction sector is especially standardized and rigorously conservative. Some practices haven't changed in centuries. Take concrete, for example. It's the second most used material in the world, only after water. If it was a country, it would have been the world's third largest carbon polluter, after China and the US. Last year, we produced 4.4 billion metric tons of concrete. According to the UN's projections, at this rate, we would be producing enough concrete to build the entire city of Paris every week for the next 40 years. That is a lot of concrete. And for several reasons, this material is not widely recycled. A big one is standardized bad practices, says Marcel Ozer, a circular engineer focused on cradle-to-cradle -cradle applications in the construction sector. If you use a gypsum plaster on concrete, on a concrete wall, it's white, it looks good, so it fulfills the purpose. But I reduce the quality of the concrete by not being able to reuse it later. So gypsum plaster makes the concrete unrecyclable, but a similar looking silicate based plaster doesn't affect the reusability of the concrete. Or let's look at steel a universally used material in construction that could have an infinite life cycle. Just the simple decision to use bolted connections rather than welded joints would allow the structure to be dismantled, making it easier to reuse the materials. It's all about designing smarter. While these individual solutions are amazingly easy to implement, unfortunately, they alone will not be enough to make the construction sector environmentally friendly, says Nora Sophie Griffin. So we need the market, we need the politicians, and we need the society to go for these ideas. And I think we are already in a stage where our society sees that we need to do something different. So Cradle to Cradle can show the solutions how this is actually possible. Cradle to Cradle is not a miraculous idea. It's just a guide for us to think and build in cycles, just like nature does. We now turn our attention back to Africa, which also faces the ongoing question, how can people ensure food security in the face of the climate crisis? It's particularly urgent question for those who live on the shores of Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. That is right, Chris. The El Molo people have long relied on fishing, but that is becoming increasingly difficult. The entire community is under threat. We paid them a visit. Alexander Lenapir looks out over the lake that's been the source of life for his people for centuries. The El Molo are an ethnic group that live in the north of Kenya's eastern province. Born in 1958, Lenapir has watched his culture slowly disappear over the years due to migration, intermarriage and, more recently, climate change. And now the El Molo are losing their land and sacred sites too. Rising water levels in Lake Turkana have engulfed roughly 800 square kilometres of land over the course of a decade, enlarging the lake by 10%. In the past, there wasn't any water here. It didn't reach this far. 
Now the water has completely flooded our village. There used to be roads here, but now there is only water everywhere you look. Most of our manyatas were just swallowed up. They totally disappeared. As rainfall became heavier and more frequent, the lake expanded and changed the landscape so much that Lenape's village was suddenly situated on an island. Many moved as a result. The others had to make major adjustments. Not only was the path to the mainland now submerging, but their freshwater pumping station was too. Now they get their water from the lake, which leaves them susceptible to diseases. Like most here, Lenape has been a fisherman all his life. But ironically, the expanding lake has actually devastated his livelihood. Before the waters rose, he would catch about 100 fish a day. Now he averages less than 10. Fish can be found in deeper waters, but the boats aren't safe enough to take out that far. Less fish means less income and less to eat, putting a further strain on local families. The children's lives are affected in other ways too. There are two schools at El Molo Bay, but the primary school is now partially submerged. Children once walked to school, but now Lenape's granddaughter Florence and many of her schoolmates can only get there by boat. In the past, we could walk to school. But when the flooding turned our land into an island, that was no longer possible. Then the county government provided boats for us to get there. An often overlooked side effect of global warming is school disruption. It threatens both the physical safety and psychosocial well-being of students and teachers. Richard Smaron is the head teacher at El Molo Bay Primary School. He's observing a drop in academic performance as well as attendance. The once crowded classrooms are often half empty. Smaron, who's been teaching for 20 years, says he's never witnessed anything like this. Climate change in a, in a effect the existence of Climate the change is threatening the existence of the Emolo tribe because we fully depend on the lake for food. If we don't have fish, we suffer. We don't have fish to sell and buy balanced meals. Not only is part of the village submerged, but so are the water pipes which destroyed our access to fresh drinking water. But the El Molo are still fighting to uphold their traditional customs and culture. While up to a thousand people identify themselves as El Molo, most are from families that have intermarried with other tribes in the region, like the Turkana, Samburu and Rendil. That too has diluted their unique identity. But they want to preserve what they have and are looking for ways to make the situation more tenable. Francis Mundia is a climate scientist based in the Lake Turkana Basin. He says putting in trees would be one relatively simple yet effective step in the right direction. It will reduce the level of water that is going to Lake Turkana as well as it will reduce the erosion. Eh? that is also goes to Lake Turkana. And when that one is done, eh, then the level of water will reduce because less water is going to the lake. The El Molo community hasn't yet decided on any major course of action. Planting trees could help, but it would also mean giving up arable land. And most importantly, it wouldn't help immediately. The situation is making Florence worried she dreams of a career in medicine, but now she fears her dream may fade because of the changes brought on by the climate crisis. I fear for my future, because if the schools end up underwater, I won't be able to get an education. The fate of this small community starkly illustrates the severity of the climate crisis. The El Molo have lived in this area for 2,000 years, if nothing changes, it could all be lost within just one decade. 
Well, that's it for today. We hope you discovered a lot of new and inspiring ideas to make life just a little bit better. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Alems. Goodbye from Ogun State, Nigeria. See you next week. And if you want to know more, follow us on our social media platforms or write to us anytime. My name is Sandra Tunobio. Do stay safe and goodbye from Kampala here in Uganda.